Broadcasting from the Annie Up Studio. It's the longest running poker podcast for the everyday poker player with your host, Joe Scale. Hello, A Team. It's Friday, February 3rd. And where did January go? <laughs> A big thank you, though, to everyone who has sent feedback in these last few weeks. Definitely keep that coming. You can always email the show at podcast at com, or you can post your thoughts in the Annie Up Fans Facebook page as well. I love to hear from you guys. Speaking of Facebook, though, I know a lot of you have kept up with us on different social media channels of your choice. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and now we're on Instagram. But if you haven't, give us a like or a follow to keep up with what's going on. And one more thing you can do for me. If you like what you hear on the show, give us a rating on whatever format you get your podcast from. That helps other people find the show as well. With all that said, let's get on with the show. Find out what conversations are happening around the poker table with Table Talk. All right, here I am around the poker table with Mike. How you doing, Mike? Hey, Joe. What's going on, my friend? I'm doing really well. Good deal. Welcome back. I hope you've had a good week so far. Absolutely have. All right, we've got a lot of topics to cover, and we don't have a ton of time to hit on them, so I'm just going to rapid fire through some of these. I want to start with something kind of fun. Do you remember Perry Green? Perry Green? Yeah. Mm, Poker, poker, poker. Perry Green. Early 80s? Uh... Yeah, close enough. Late seventies. Okay. Um, I mean, he's been around for he's been around for a while, but he won three World Series of Poker bracelets in seventy six, seventy seven, and seventy nine. Wow, nice, nice. But uh, he showed up again in the news this week. Ooh, and I know. We talked last week to Todd Lemansky. He's our LA ambassador. We talked to him about the LAPC. It was happening at the Commerce. But Perry Green showed up in the news there at the Commerce after winning his first tournament in 35 years. Good Lord Almighty. 35 years. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh, he's he's played a lot, you know, and and he's cashed a lot, you know, in in tournaments throughout the years. Yeah, but this is his first tournament win in thirty five years. Now that's oh. that's a long drought between first place. His last victory was in nineteen eighty seven. It was a two hundred twenty five dollar no limit hold'em event where he won fourteen thousand one hundred and thirty dollars. Good gosh, Almighty! You know what? What what year was that? 1987. 87, 87. You know, I was only making about that annually around that time. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> but uh, this time he outlasted 91 players in a $400 mixed Omaha event. Mm. Uh, just excited to see that for him. His Hendon Mob shows him in the WSOP each year. He's got a cash probably every year, but it's awesome to see that he got uh, he got a first place again. Oh heck yeah! I bet you he's tickled things a lot for him. I'm very proud of him. Oh yeah, I mean congratulations to him. But uh, we also have some news in the online poker world. You want to talk about those proposed things in Kentucky, Indiana, and New Hampshire? Because I I saw yeah. those. New, so New York has been working for a while toward legalization of online poker, but now. Indiana, Kentucky, New Hampshire, they've all joined in and uh, they're going to introduce some bills toward that milestone as well. It's still crazy to me. We've got the fact that we only have seven states that have online poker is crazy weak. to me. Very weak. Before I get into the dates of what it is, just a side note here. Have you ever heard the word Racino? Racino. Never. The only Racine I know is in Illinois. <laughs> well... Well, this one has an O at the end. <laughs> Racino. Oh, okay. um, All right. No, I haven't heard I mean, of it's it. exactly what it sounds like it would be. It's it's a racing ground and a casino, but I had never heard it before until I started looking at all this. So it's, wow. it's kind well, of dogs, mainly dogs and horses? or Dogs or horses, yeah, either one huh. it can be a wow. racino. Back to back to the original story. So we have to, we have to keep our fingers crossed for a couple of dates. 
So February 27th, that's an important date because that's the last day that the House bills have to go to the Senate. So they have to approve their bills and send them to the Senate by February 27th. Mm. Then That's coming up right around. uh, Yeah, this month, yeah. Then the next important date will be April 18th because that's the date that the Senate must pass or deny bills that originated in the House. So we hope for pass, obviously. As soon if it makes it to uh, the, so, yeah, yes. if it makes it to the Senate, then they've got until the 18th to get it sent through there. Awesome, that's awesome. Hey, talking about bills, how about Hawaii? Yeah, this is pretty cool because yeah. they're proposing a bill to legalize live sports betting and poker in privately owned parlors. That's awesome. But the thing that I thought was most fascinating about this was there are over 7,200 illegal gaming rooms in operation there. Oh, no, no. what you say? <laughs> 7,200. I, I mean, in Hawaii? in Hawaii, in tiny little Hawaii, that seems like a lot. Okay, where are they putting them? <laughs> Every other house, apparently. Uh, <laughs> well, they might be in boats. I don't know. <laughs> Fair <Boats>. enough. <laughs> oh, Lord. I mean. That seems like an awful lot. You're right. (laughs) So obviously when you've got illegal, I guess, poker rooms or anything else running there, then the theory is there are other illegal things that are happening along with that. So their hope is... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So their hope is if they legalize the poker rooms and some sports betting in there, then that'll give people a legal venue to play poker and make it easier to regulate the other activities. Uh, and of course, I understand that. Yeah. And of course, yeah, I, I bet the other part tax. Absolutely, there you go. <laughs> yeah, buddy, get the money. You follow the money always. Yeah, man. So here's the other side to that. They said that Hawaiians are spending about a billion dollars a year in Vegas. So they want their piece of that pie. A billion. A billion with a B. Oh. Again, we're talking about a hmm. fairly small place, and uh, and they're spending a billion dollars hmm. a year in Vegas. Holy cow. Must be a lot of sailors and army guys heading that away on their oh, leave. That's, a, that's oh. a fair point. Uh, I'm glad that they're getting it there. It gives, it gives them a chance to keep it in, uh, keep it in the state. Yeah. That's the way I... Yeah. And, and hmm. of course... You know, in Hawaii's case, they get to keep that tax revenue, like you said, in in there, and they're they're planning on building affordable housing with the money that they raise. So, ah, uh, you see, there, that's even better. Yeah. Hey, hey, talking about talking about games and stuff. Let me ask you a question, real yeah. quick. Yeah. Um, the remember back. What's the first real poker game besides with your friends and your family and stuff that you really got into? Oh, um, wow. Uh, I. Pff- Probably it was probably just a hundred dollar buy in. I don't know. So Texas Hold'em probably or Omaha or yeah, it was it was Hold'em. It was definitely Hold'em. Maybe oh, thirty okay. or forty people in the tournament. Not nothing nothing okay. big. Well, I remember mine. Um, I had joined a, a group of uh, people that did stuff for the communities, and uh, thought I was doing something for everybody. And after the meetings and and all this stuff, we would uh we'd all go down to the local Ramada Inn. They had a, a lounge there and uh, live bands playing in a nice lounge with some good mixed drinks, everything. And uh, uh, this one lawyer would rent a room at the Ramada Inn for him to stay in. And then he'd have another room to play poker in every night after, or, you know, once a month after our meeting. We'd sit around and play maybe seven or eight of us sitting around. And that's where I was introduced to more money poker than I've ever played in my life. There you go. Um, dollars were swinging everywhere on seven card stud. There you go, seven and card I had, stud. Yeah, I love that game. It's my favorite out of all of them. Anyhow, actually, that's the perfect segue into what I want to talk about next, which is the World Series of Poker. Yeah, yeah. They 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 finally released the schedule, and uh, there's some highlights that that we ought to talk about. You started off talking about it because there's a couple of, you know, there's some things I want to say, especially about my event that I'm picking. All right. So first of all, this is the 54th World Series of Poker. You know, last year was the first year that it moved from Rio to Bally's in Paris. And this year, Bally's has officially been renamed the Horseshoe. But yeah, so they've got two new events this year. Um, which one? Which one are you going to? Oh, this first one here, they got a new event this year called the Gladiators. 
Makes um, sense. I guess it's named because it's a Caesar's property. Uh, you know, it's a three hundred dollar buy-in. Uh, it's going to make it the least expensive buy-in of the series. Oh, it's going to have okay. a guaranteed guaranteed prize pool of three million dollars. Three there you go. million dollars. Now do the math. That means they expect <laughs> to have over ten thousand players. Yeah, that's got to that, be a record. For that right? breakdown. Oh yeah, they've got it's got to set an attendance record. It's got yeah. there. And speaking of the record, yeah. are you going with me? <laughs> That's the one you're going to oh, play, huh? Let me tell you, there's over 10,000 players. Yes. Yeah, so if you lose, then you can at least say that you were part of the record, right? Right. It cost me 300 bucks. Exactly. The thing about it is I want to know what's going to feel like to beat out 10,000 or more people and win $3 million. That's a big field, and I'm not sure that you've got the patience for that, Mike. Oh, heck yeah. I can do that, because they got to have a donkey somewhere down there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the Ultra Stack is the other new one on the schedule. It's a $600 buy-in. I'm guessing, given the name Ultra Stack, you're probably going to start with a whole bunch of chips. Well, I'm looking forward to the main event. Main event's going to start on July 3rd. Um, of course, they're going to have four starting flights. Still, obviously, it's still $10,000 to enter. But hey, don't forget, you could win your seat with the Camp One Step Charity Tournament in Chicago. We're going to talk more about that in a little bit. Talk to me about the one on the 14th. That's the final event. So appropriately, it is called The Closer. Mm. Uh, and it's going to be a $1,500 buy-in. So. Wow. Yeah, that'd be um, fun. Yeah, that's, I mean, the whole series, they've got a total of 95 events, which, man, that's a long summer. Yeah, it is. But this part of July, though, that's just, I got to go, got to go. Listen, uh, yeah, it's been fun for some of our A team. Uh, at some of these games, I'm going to be uh, heading out to a lot of stuff with you. Yep. Uh, we may be uh, playing some of their cash games at the new casino in Portsmouth, Virginia, at the Rivers. Um, so, Joe, thank you for everything. I'll talk to you next week. Sounds good. Thanks, Mike. Now it's time for Call the Floor with Elliot Schechter. Elliot Schechter is the poker room manager for Rivers Casino in Schenectady, New York. He's been the one to give the feedback on the Call the Floor segment for quite some time, and he's here with us today. Hey, Elliot, how are you? I'm doing pretty well, thanks. How are you doing today? I am doing well. I understand you've got a good tournament coming up. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. April 13th to the 23rd, we are going to be having the Electric City Poker Series. Nice. Soon to be approved by the New York State Gambling Commission. So uh, watch our website and uh, and our spot on the Bravo app for all details. All right. Then let's get into our call the floor here. Uh, this one is sent in by Charles Lee. He says he's playing a home cash game. Uh, I open with pocket jacks under the gun to $12 and get called by a middle position player and the big blind. Flop comes four, seven, nine, all spades. Big blind checks. I lead out for $30. Middle position folds and big blind calls. Turn is an offsuit king. We both check. River is the ace of spades. I complete a jack high flush. I look at the big blinds stack. She has roughly $45 ish remaining. I have roughly 250 ish dollars behind. She checks the river. I lead out for $55 thinking it covers her stack. She announces all in. Thinking she had closed the action, I table my hand. She shows ace of diamonds, 10 of spades. The dealer scoots my cards forward to get them out of the way and slides me the pot. The lady begins to yell at the dealer. He folded. That's my pot. We both look at her confused, and it turns out she covered my bet by exactly $7. She had, in fact, raised me $7. Both the dealer and myself thought that my bet covered her. In this situation... The house ruled that the intent was clear and was not folding, and I was not folding for an extra $7. So I was awarded the pot. Would that be the case in a casino setting? Well, there's a lot to unpack here. I mean, this is a very simple decision, but there are so many different things happening all at the same time. <laughs> so let's go through it detail by detail, because this is a fairly interesting one for uh, something that it probably happens more than it should. 
let's go back to when when you bet thinking that you bet enough to put your opponent all in. Uh, Charles, if that was your intention, why didn't you announce all in? This way, by doing that, none of the other sentences in your paragraph have to be printed. Uh, it cuts off everything. <laughs> if your intention was to bet more than your opponent had, then why didn't you do it? So some of this is on you, I hate to say. Then uh, she announces all in. Apparently, she had more than uh, what you bet, uh, $7 to be exact. Again, if you wanted to know how much she had, why didn't you ask? This is a no-limit game, table stakes, I'm assuming. So it's completely reasonable uh, to ask what your lone opponent in the pot has at the time. So again, another thing on you, you could have very simply asked what she had and, and made sure you bet at least that amount. Uh, you assumed she had some amount of money and bet an amount less than all in for you or her. You getting the pot in this spot is correct. I'm not counting that $7 as a raise, and it doesn't. Uh, it's merely $7 more than you bet. Uh, in No Limit Hold'em, any raise has to be at least 100% of the current bet in play. So you bet $55. Her raising less than 55 doesn't constitute uh, a raise, and certainly a $7 nuisance bet. She was absolutely eligible to get action on all of the chips she had in front of her, but that certainly doesn't count as a raise. And considering it's such a small percentage of both the pot and the current bet, I'm certainly not overturning your winning the pot in that case. So the situation was right. I'm not going to assume future intent. I'm not assuming you're calling the $7. Uh, the action was offered and accepted. It wasn't refused as action until the pot started going the other way. Both the hands were turned over at showdown. At that point, she accepted the action. Watching the chips go to you, all of a sudden now she has an objection. So again, the $7 becomes relevant in that particular case because it was such a small amount of all of the money in play at that time. Uh, you absolutely had no intention of folding for that $7. You stated so yourself. Your intention was to put her to the test of being all in. So again, you got the pot correctly. I would have awarded you the pot had I been flooring that game. And then I would have admonished you for not paying enough attention, as I already did. <laughs> so... All of that, like you said, all of that could have been avoided if he just puts all his chips in the middle or just says, I I'm all in. Precisely. Or, or even just asks for a count. Exactly. Uh, to be able to do that. Yeah. So uh, hopefully that was a lesson learned and you can move on from that. All right. Good luck, Charles. That is our Call the Floor segment for today. Thank you, Elliot. You're welcome, Joe. Good to talk to you as always. Let's break it down with Hand of the Week. All right, here we are with Tay Whiteside going through another Hand of the Week this week. Hello, uh, everyone. We're back again. Reacting, <laughs> dissecting, uh, learning. <laughs> <laughs> Today's Hand of the Week is sent in by Lucas Teague. So Lucas is playing 1-2 cash. So $1, $2 are the blinds. Very accessible. I like it. His... His stack is about $190. Mm -hmm. So he says, action folds to me in the cutoff, and I have king of clubs, queen of diamonds. The cutoff is you're so, the last person before bef the dealer, before, before the it goes button. Yep. back around. Okay. Yep. So it folded around to you. You've got the button, you've got the small blind, and you've got the big blind. I have a king of clubs and queen of diamonds. Yep. What are you doing? It's all folded. I'm going to play something. The big blind's two. It would be a very boring hand of the week if you decided I'm just going to fold here. Yeah, I mean, that, wouldn't, <laughs> that doesn't say much about me, right? <laughs> no, the, the fun part about this podcast is I get to pretend uh, that I am someone else, right? Correct. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in this case, being truthful to myself, I mean, I'm going to bet something, right? There's been right. so little action on this round. I got a king, queen. It's got to be, I mean... The statistics of getting a decent pair with five cards hitting the table is, is pretty high. I'm going to play something. Yeah, I would I, at least a $5 bet, maybe a $10 bet, depending on how much whiskey I've had at this <laughs> particular <laughs> table of, of poker, you know? Okay. Yeah, I'm betting something. I mean, All right. I'm assuming you're going to do the same, yeah? So my thought is the button's going to be the only one that has position on us, right? So I'm going to raise, but I'm not going to go crazy, right? Mm. I'm not going to... Come on, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's three players left to act. I'm going to raise... The other, the other side of this, we don't know how aggressive the, the table's been, right? Right. So we, we get no backstory. We don't know who we're playing. <laughs> so a lot of folds tells me that there's not a whole lot of... Probably true stuff going on. Um, but. I, I'm going to raise anywhere from six to ten. So, so kind of similar. We're, we're 
we're in the same ballpark. Wow, I, I, that's a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, playing something, right? You got yeah, to. Yeah. This said this is an accessible sort of round of poker. And it's funny like scale the the, the big time players would feel as comfortable as I feel comfortable with a 1 2 small blind big blind. The big players, the whole scale has shifted. Right. What they're comfortable <laughs> with is far different than like what I'm comfortable with. Sure. $2 big blind, I'm going to throw some money down <laughs> the table, you know? <laughs> Uh, okay, but in this case, Lucas uh, raises to eight. Okay. The button and small blind fold, and the big blind calls. Wow, that's got to make you feel okay, right? Yeah, so the only the only one that we got to uh, worry about is the big blind. That's good. And they just called our $8 raise. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. good. All yep. right. The pot is $17 now, and the flop comes out. King of hearts, two of clubs, ten of hearts. So we've got a pair of kings, Yeah, and that's it. Big two, blind checks. There's two hearts out there, right? We got to worry about that a little bit because uh, we have none. We don't have any hearts. Yeah. yeah, top pair, but we've got a good kicker, right? So if they had a pair of kings, but something less than a queen, we win. Yeah, that's the. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we got to hope that they don't have like king ten. That mm. would suck. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but they check to us, so yeah, I'm gonna bet again. Pots what seventeen, so I'm gonna yep. bet. I'm gonna bet ten into there. Yeah, that's an easy one. I, I, I me seeing pair of kings. Love it. They check. I'm also going to bet. $10 sounds good. Again, if I feel extra saucy, I might even I might even go for it. Careful. But we're definitely betting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so in this case, Lucas, with top pair and being a little worried about the hearts, I bet $10 in the big blind snap calls me. So no hesitation calls okay. that bet. So the one thing that I think about, anytime anybody snap calls me or snap checks or whatever, they take it a quick action like that. To me, it feels like a draw. Anytime anybody snaps like that, then I feel like it's, it's some kind of draw. Meaning what? So they're drawing to, more than likely in this case, a flush. The draw means you right. want to see what flips over next. Yeah. Got exactly. it. Uh, yeah, snap calls. So flush draw is definitely in play. God, I sound so official. <laughs> Pot is $37. The turn is the seven of diamonds and the big blind checks. Okay. So everything points to a draw here, right? So the idea then is that he's sitting on two hearts. That's what, what we, I guess what we should be worried about. Two yeah. on the table. And I, he's that's waiting. what I'm thinking. He's just playing to see that last I one. guess the possibility. There is there is a chance that he has king ten. Mm. That's we mentioned that earlier. It's possible, and and just letting Limping us along. letting us throw out the money rather than him not trying to raise flags or anything like that. Right? That's a possibility. It's still a pretty mild hand, though. You know, I'm not too sure that that's where we're at. It doesn't really make sense to me. Well, this last round is going to tell us if he's like milking us for money or not. <laughs> right. 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 Well, here on this round, I think I think I want to bet a little bit bigger, Bef- uh, uh, bigger on the sizing, just because if he does have a heart, I want to make it not worth him putting more money in for it. So I'm really for the hoping, chance to get a heart on the river. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm going to I'm going to bet a little bit bigger and just hope that he folds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I'm still feeling confident again as a more novice player playing sort of a reactionary game king in the hand king on the table that's exciting no suits to think about but still a pair of kings and he's just been checking and calling yeah you know i I bet it definitely feels good i don't know that i'd go big bet but i'm not gonna let him get there for free you know a little a little something so i'm i mean i what do you bet i could go up to 30 here Mm. Uh, for sure. What it was, it was 30, what? 37, 37 is 37. in the pot. Yeah. So I could go 30 here for sure. Yeah. I think that's where I would go $30. Yeah. I mean, I'd probably max out at half of that, but still, I'm still putting money on the table for sure. Okay. Well, in this case, Lucas Teague here, with the heart still looming in the back of my mind, I don't want to give him a free card. So I bet $20. So he bets a 20. The so big, he was somewhere in between what you and I said. Yeah. yeah. Which is good. Yeah. Uh, the big blind thinks for about 30 seconds before throwing in the call. Okay, so we went from a snap call to a delay of game. (laughs) (laughs) With $77 now in the pot, the river is the four of diamonds, the card we've all been waiting for. (laughs) Big blind leads into me firing $80. What's the pot again? 77 is the pot. Four diamonds hits the table, and then Lucas bets 80. He leads, so this guy just bet 80 on the river. Yeah, this time he said, I'm not going to let you make the bet. That's right. He's been checking up front. Okay, yeah. yeah. So he leads into us for $80. $80. More than the pot. 
Yeah. Three dollars more in the pot. It feels kind of bluffy, doesn't it? Um, yeah, it's it's we're getting shoved into the locker <laughs> in between math class and English <laughs> class in middle school. <laughs> what are you gonna do about it, huh? Um, I mean, here's the thing: if if he has the hand that we were all worried about, right? That that we've mentioned on the King Street, ten. The King Ten. Yeah. If he has King Ten, then he's afraid that we're gonna check behind. Uh, right. You want to milk the table but for if as much. That's cash. the case. If that's the case, why so much? On the at the end, yeah. So he's betting more than pot. If he wanted and to the, try, and the two cards leading up is a seven of diamonds and a four of diamonds. Right, no diamonds on the table prior to that. I feel like if he wanted us to call, he bets smaller. Right, mm-hmm. he's gonna bet. 40, 45, 50 even. Yeah, to make us think for 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the fact that he's betting so big, like what, what, other, hand, what other hands are beating us here? I mean, I, I can't think of. I mean. I, I feel like he was, he was looking for those hearts. Yeah, didn't get them. Didn't get them, so he's trying to bluff us. I, I, so I'm, I'm going to call. I'm not going to raise him. What else? He, he could have. So the flop was, he's not playing Doyle's hand, uh, which is the 10 deuce. Mm. Um, he's not playing that. Uh, so you're going to call the so 80. I'm, yeah, I'm just going to call. I'm not going to raise him. Yeah, man. I would call, I'd probably call too. That, that call, me, for me to call this is a giant move as a novice, you know, because it's a lot of money. But it's, I think my action would be propped up by the fact that the last two cards was a seven and a four. And there yeah. was a, nothing but checking into us prior to that. So... Yeah, you got to – I want to see what it hits. I want to see what hits the table. So what did uh, – Lucas. What did Lucas do? Lucas says, I could not think of a hand that made sense here. Maybe he was trying to get me to fold after missing the flush, or maybe he had something like two pair and was afraid of me checking on the river. I folded, and he shows his hand. The jack of clubs and the nine of clubs. Oh, no. He had nothing. He was looking for a queen. Oh, you're Jack-y saying he had a straight draw. Yeah. Yeah. So he was he was on the draw. He just sure wasn't did. on the draw that we, we were putting him on. <laughs> uh, Lucas says, I got up from the table and took a walk. Still ended up in the positive for the night, but that hand still haunts me. <laughs> I never once thought about I, a straight. I, you know what? Did I, you? It didn't even cross my mind, to be yeah. honest. I was so concentrating on the, the hearts. But still, whether it's the straight or the hearts, the, the story didn't make sense. I, I, the I behavior was wild. I don't think I don't think I could fold there just because the story didn't add up. Sorry, man. You you just didn't hang in there. <laughs> <laughs> no guts, no glory. Lucas is like, who's this new guy <laughs> giving me crap about how I play poker? <laughs> you had him in the palm of your hand, man. <laughs> no, it's tough, man. You know, it's it's yeah. money. It's yeah. your money. It's it's, it's emotions. It's easy. It's easier to sit here on a uh, looking at a microphone and, and mm-hmm. say that, right? Yeah, with zero cash in my pocket <laughs> right. right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that, right. that was a good one. Uh, that the end of that's definitely. Uh, I could see how that one followed you home. Yeah. All right, Lucas. Well, I'm glad you ended in the positive for the night, at least. That's our hand of the week this week. Thanks, Tay, for joining us on this one again. If you have a hand of the week that you would like Tay and I to go through, then send it to us at podcast at com. Send them in, man. And we will see you next week. Appreciate it. See you, Joe. The question is, how you running? All right, so this week we're going to do something a little different. We talked about the Camp One Step Charity Poker Tournament last week with uh, Bob Popper. But this week I have Jeff Infusino with uh, Camp One Step, and we're going to talk a little more details. Typically, I ask everybody how you're running in this segment, but uh, I know you've got a lot going on there. So I'll just ask you, uh, how you doing, Jeff? Great show. How are you? And thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. I'm doing well. Absolutely. We talked a a little bit about this before we we got on here, but one of the things that's important to me is is building the charity aspect of of Annie Up. So this is kind of a perfect joint venture here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's start with the tournament details, and then I want to get a little bit more into detail of Camp One Step itself and what you guys are doing. So registration is open as of yesterday, right? That is correct. And you could uh, register... 
in a couple of ways, but most importantly, if you just want to text COS Poker to seven six two seven eight, that'll get you into Poker, uh, and that will get you just a registration. You can go to our website, which is camponestep.org slash Poker, and that'll get you in as well. But registration is open. I think one of the key things to remember is that the first hundred people to register will get a free add-in on or five thousand chips, it's about an extra hundred dollar value. Um, so, I mean, it's just, it's great. Uh, get in early. Uh, the tournament sold out last year. Uh, I, any listeners heard Bob talk about it last week and, uh, it was, it was a great time, but yeah, you know, we're just trying to get people to get in, uh, enjoy the event. Uh, most importantly, when you register, there's two tiers. Uh, the first tier is at $300, which is the player level. You can just come in and, and you get paired up at a table and you go compete for the you know world series of poker championship, or you can get in at a high roller level, which is $700. And the great thing about how high roller, even though it's a little bit more money, it really narrows the field for you. There's only 30 people, uh, opportunities to get in. And three of those folks at those of that 30 is going to get into the final table of 10. So your odds go up, opportunity goes up, and you get some other perks to go along with that. So uh, last year that did sell out and it sold, it sold out pretty early. But we're really excited to have this this opportunity to see a lot of poker players, but also serve our kids that way. Perfect. And you also, you have a spectator mm-hmm. entry as well. What does that entail? That entails you come out. So every everybody that attends, whether you're a, a player, a high roller seat or a spectator and the cost for a spectator is $125. It's open bar and uh, dinner is included. And the great thing about spectators, we have some poker instruction tables uh, that people can can sit at and look at and, and get to know the game of poker. Great food. Gallery Marchetti in Chicago is an excellent venue. Uh, but we also have uh, a whiskey tasting event. So from some high end uh, whiskey is, is there for people to kind of uh, take a look at and, and enjoy, but it's open bar, it's dinner. Uh, it's just a great time. And being a spectator, you kind of feel the vibe, even though you're not at the tables playing. Yeah. Well, that's important to me because I'm going to be out there. I'm going to come out to the event and uh, my wife will, will come join me. She is not a poker player, so uh, she'll be able to take in some of that other stuff. Let's get into a little bit more about Camp One Step as well. Tell me a little bit about what you guys do. Yeah, no, absolutely happy to do that. And before I go further on the Camp One stuff, I do want to oh. congratulate you on on uh, this new venture and this new opportunity. And you're doing a great job, and and I know you're going to be incredibly successful. So you know, we just look forward to hearing more and more about what you're doing, and and uh, to everybody out there. You know, just keep following Joe and listening because he's doing an amazing job. So I appreciate that. Um, my pleasure. Um, for Camp, we were formed and started actually started in 1978. And the reason we got started is because, you know, kids, when they're diagnosed, their life changes immediately. And uh, a doctor out of out of uh, children's uh, Chicago, uh, his name was Dr. Baum. He uh, talked about, hey, these kids cannot continue to just only see doctors and nurses and and be a part of that. They need to get out and be kids again. So right. through his vision started uh, our first camp, which is summer camp. So we had about 40 kids out there uh, at at, that time. Uh, And then we've grown. And that mission has not changed uh, from the day we started in 1978 to we're going to celebrate our 45th summer camp this year, this summer. And so 45 years, we'll serve over 20,000 kids. Wow. Um, But the most important thing is not, you know, not letting kids think that cancer is going to define their lives. But, you know, the biggest challenge that they have is, you know, from both a child and a family perspective, uh, once that diagnosis comes in, uh, their life is flipped upside down immediately. And they now have to figure out, you know, what's going to happen in their lives. Um, you know, and we all, as, as we look at things, you know, our lives kind of ebb and flow differently. But, you know, we kind of get some transition sometimes where they don't. So our job is to ensure that that child doesn't lose sight, that they can a dream again, that they can participate, they can achieve things they thought they couldn't do. And even though their life may change because of cancer, that new normal doesn't change what they can they can do in their life, right? Yeah, that's 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 incredible. When they go to camp, is it a situation where they go get away from their family for a little bit or does their family come with them? What? How does that work? No, it's a great question. We have 11 different programs that we serve the entire family. And when I mean the entire family, there are specific programs. We have a sibling only program and then our rest of our programs are for children that have been diagnosed with cancer. We've realized over the years that, you know, we started with the one summer camp 
we needed to make sure that the whole family came together because there's disconnection throughout. Uh, from a sibling's perspective, mom and dad are so focused on their child that's that's going through chemotherapy or in the hospital. And there's long hospital stays or there's repetitive hospital stays where the sibling has to get to where they need to go from an aunt, an uncle, a friend. Right. So they're they're disconnected, right? The, the parents are you know, dealing with what's going to happen to my child the next three months, ten, six months, you know, one year. But when it, when a person, when a child comes to camp, they come to camp to experience whatever it may be. So those 11 programs, uh, they're seasonal. So we have programs throughout the year. Our first winter program just finished. That was our winter camp that's done in Williams Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, kids will go tubing. They'll just kind of hang out with each other, be out, do a lot of outside activities. And, and, but it's just for the patients, right? So for the, for the kids that are diagnosed. As you move further, the next, our, our next program is the Utah Ski Camp, which is done in Park City, Utah. So 30 kids go out to Park City, Utah. But the most important thing about that is that we have, um, instructors that are teaching kids with disabilities. So for instance, if a child is in a wheelchair, they can still ski in a, in a sit ski. So it's kind of a sled where you sit in it. And we have instructors that guide them down the mountain. Um, kids that are vision impaired, kids that are um, amputees are actually skiing down double diamonds. Um, <laughs> I can't stay stay upright on a set of skis just when it's level, <laughs> let alone going on a double diamond, right? Exactly. Um, but but the most important thing again is that achievement perspective and saying that you can do things that you thought you couldn't do, right? It's the cancer gives you the I can't in life, but camp gives you the I can, and that's the most important thing we try to do. You know, just to kind of stay focused on the Utah camp for a little bit is that we have a camper because of his diagnosis and his cancer treatment. He used to ski with his dad when he was younger. Um, they used to go skiing locally and, and do things and then get progressively better as he went along. But cancer took that away. Mm. And by now being able to, he didn't know about, you know, adaptive equipment for skiing. And where now he can ski again. He says, now my dad and I can get back together and ski. I love that. What he never thought was possible, right? Yeah. So after that, we have a Chicago day camp that's for kids five to 10. We have a brain tumor family camp that's specifically for, for kids that uh, and families that have a child with uh, that's been diagnosed with a brain tumor because brain tumors are definitely very specific in, in their diagnosis and treatment. We have a sibling camp uh, that takes place uh, in, in the summer. Uh, the summer camp, which is our longest program, that is two weeks. And then we have an adventure program, uh, a dude ranch program, our camp program, which you go out to a dude ranch and ride horses out in the, <laughs> in, the in the middle of the woods and go camp, and, you know, and do things where they serve you. And they have a rodeo and they learn how to take care of animals. Another family camp in October. And then we, as I mentioned, we finish the year uh, with our winter camp. So we are, we're quite active, but we're also quite involved in making sure the kids have an experience. Um, the other thing that are, are all of our, uh, camps are free, which is important. Um, and as well as a, a child can go as many times as they want, right? This is not exclusive. You can go one program and not go to another program. Okay. Actually, the, the cost is something that I wanted to ask you about because I don't imagine it's cheap to send these kids to these programs. Um, there's probably got to be extra medical staff and, mm-hmm. and uh, extra equipment and things like that, right? Yeah, that's a great question. We have um, at all of our programs, there's uh, a medical staff that we have. Um, the great thing about our organization is we do have you know staff that that work for the organization. We have over 400 volunteers that support us. We have you know, volunteer medical staff. We do have a medical director on staff that works with. But there are medical on every every single program. And when you look at costs, it, like everything else in the last couple of years, costs have gone up, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, it, it, we used to look at this thing as about a thousand dollars per camper and that has changed significantly gone up. But, um, you know, regardless of the cost, we are never going to not have a child come to camp for free. And that means if it's, if it's a child coming to camp or a parent and a whole family coming to camp, um, you know, that's, that's where they do. They do come for free and, and we'll continue that because that experience to us is important. That's where tournaments like this come into play, right? Mm -hmm. So the thing I would encourage everybody to do is if you have the time, make it out here. I know Chicago is kind of in the middle 
So we can <laughs> uh, pull from, from all around the country. And so if you have the ability and you have the time, then uh, make it out there to this tournament. And yeah, no, I think it's it's a great thing for people to enjoy. It's not that Chicago's kind of in the hub, you're right. And and for the poker player that comes out, um, not only do you have the opportunity to, to win, you know, a seat at the World Series of Poker, uh, you get to understand a little bit about what we do, uh, but it's a, it's a great time. So, so it, you're serving a dual purpose. You're coming in and experiencing something for you as the poker player to be able to win a seat, the World Series of Poker or the top 10 individual with great prizes, you know, at, at the final table. Uh, there's a lot of camaraderie. There's a lot of competition. But most mm-hmm. importantly, you personally are making an impact on a child that's diagnosed with cancer. And it's felt, you know, when you think about that and you look at what we raised last year of $155,000, you know, that's, you know, 150 kids, you know, that you've made a difference in their lives or campers or families to be able to go to camp and say cancer gets checked at the door. Right. It's really important. Do you have a, do you have a goal this year that you want to reach? Well, you know, it's always about if you hit a, if you hit 150, you know, you know, last year, we'd like to do more than that sure. you know, this year. But the other thing I want to throw out there, too, in addition to the seats, there's sponsorships that we uh, we have available for any any company okay. or um, individual that's wants to jump into a sponsorship. But, you know, our goal is if we can get to where we were last year, increase a little bit. But most importantly, you know, get folks to come in and really know what Camp One Step's all about and really feel the, the uh, you know, the difference that they're going to make and, and have a great time. You know, we have bounty players from different disciplines. We have Dan Birdstein from the score in Chicago. That is the MC. You know, we're just excited. Yeah, you know, me too. And it's such a good point. Just a little bit more can help so much. Mm -hmm. But to that point, this isn't the only fundraiser that you guys do. As time gets closer, I know I looked at uh, you guys have a golf tournament later on. So I want to talk a little bit more about this when we get closer to it. But uh, after this is over, I want to bring you back and and talk a little bit about that that golf tournament as well. Yeah, no, I'd be happy to to talk about that and and talk about all the other things we have going on from a fundraising perspective. And, you know, I'm just great grateful that you were able to bring me on and talk about it because at the end of the day, I can't tell you how many families have said seeing my son or daughter go to camp, whichever one it was, they were, you know, not themselves, but when they've come back to camp, they're laughing, they're talking, they feel encouraged, they feel that they can do things. And that's what we're here to do. And that's what everybody that's listening to this, that comes to the event is going to make a child smile, going to make it apparent feel that their child is back and cancer doesn't have that grip on that child anymore. And the roads are tough, but you know, everybody in, on this podcast, again, thanking you, Joe, but most importantly, everybody that will come to that tournament will feel a little bit of that as well. Yeah. That, I mean, that's what it's all about. Listen, Jeff, I appreciate you taking the time to let everybody know what's going on, help everybody learn a little bit about Camp One Step, and uh, just a uh, reminder, the tournament's Thursday, April 20th, but the registration's open now. The seats, $300 seats, if you get in before the first 100, then you get an extra 5,000 chips. Did I miss anything? Nope, that is correct. And um, if there is uh, any, you know, like I said, go to our website for more details on, on the on the event, and then or text COS Poker to seven six two seven eight to to get in as well, which is an easy way to get entry. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you again, Jeff. Joe, thank you. Okay. Have a great one. You too. It's time for Joe's one outer. Do you know who John Van Newman is? It's okay, not many people do. But he, along with Alan Turing, helped invent the computer. He's also one of the innovators of the hydrogen bomb, and he pioneered game theory. He was also a huge advocate for poker. John Van Neumann attributed poker for inspiring insights into the decision-making process and called it the ultimate game for approximating the strategic challenges of life. But poker, to many, is easy. In fact, Countless players in their home game seem to think they are just a slide over from being the next big-name poker pro. Most of these people, though, underestimate the skill involved. I mean, it seems simple enough, right? Get good cards and ship it, baby. Or bluff everyone and ship it again. Poker definitely has an element of chance. But so does taking over an established poker media company. Are we any more of a gambler than the professional athlete that may or may not find themselves with a career-ending injury? In some ways, a poker player is gambling less than the athlete, 
After all, if we twist an ankle or break a bone, <laughs> we can still play. There was a study done by a man named Ingo Fiedler, where he analyzed hundreds of thousands of poker hands played over a six-month period. What he found was that in those hands, the best cards won, on average, 12% of the time, and very few hands went to showdown. So I guess in many ways, poker is the skilled endeavor. The world outside of the poker room is the gamble. Betting on uncertainty, though, is what the American dream is all about, and that's what I did when I took over Annie Up. It doesn't take a gambler to understand why. That's today's one-outer, and that's our show. See you next week, A-Team. And until then, I'll see you at the tables. The Annie Up Podcast is a production of AnnieUpMagazine.com. Contact the show at podcast at AnnieUpMagazine.com or call the show at 540-339-7741. If you'd like to advertise, send an email to editor at AnnieUpMagazine.com. <laughs>